We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus, this day. We glorify your holy name, Lord. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, Lord God. Your goodness and mercy that follows us, Lord, all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in your house forever, Lord. We just want to praise you this morning, Lord. We want to lift up your glorious name, Lord God. We thank you for our friendship with you, Lord God. We thank you for divine fellowship. We thank you for this blessed communion, Lord God. That you, Jesus, are our Savior, our Lord, and our friend. So we just want to honor you today, Lord God. We want to lift our voices in praise. We want to celebrate your love, Lord God. How marvelous, how wonderful you are, Lord God. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you, Lord God, for the life that you give us, Lord God. Blessed be your name. Darling of heaven crucified, died for me. Risen now, exalted to God's right hand in glory, evermore to the King. Coming again to rule and reign, coming again, coming again.
When you were lifted on that cross, Lord, you drew all sin to you, Lord. You are punished for all the sin of all mankind. So we look to you this day, the author and the finisher, the one who began a good work in us and will continue to his conclusion. We celebrate you, Lord.
Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, name of all names, salvation in another name, but your name, my Lord, oh, marvelous Jesus, wonderful Lord God, we worship you. Wonderful Lord God, we praise you. We praise your name, O oh God. We glorify your name. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, the Lord. The earth is on with your praise, my God. We will praise you, our lips will praise you, Lord. Why you give us breath of life? How marvelous you are, O oh God. How wonderful is my Lord and Savior. How glorious are you, King of kings, Lord of all. Jesus, our God, worthy is your name. Oh, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Sing Oh, 
Blessed be your name, Lord. We will trust in you. up his very life for you so that you can have his life of eternity his eternal life is there anything else that he would even think about holding back all he asks is that we believe Just trust in Him on the darkest of nights. Just trust in Him when it seems like the enemy is coming in like a flood. Because when He does, the Lord raises up a standard against Him. He raises up the standard of His Word against Him. And you have no need to fear. Because He guides your ways in righteousness for His name's sake. Anoint your head with oil, he sets you apart. Anointing your head with oil. As you lift up your cup before him, as you lift up your life before him, he fills it to overflowing. And you can feast on his pure delight. Just trust. Once again, 
in obedience to your command on that night when you were betrayed, when you took the cup and you said that this was your blood. The new covenant, the new covenant, Lord God, the new arrangement between God and man. No longer holding man's sin against him. And your body represented by the bread which was broken and bruised and by your wounds you purchased healing for mankind. By your blood you purchased forgiveness. So we thank you for the wholeness that's in you. And today, Lord God, as we take the bread and as we drink the cup, Lord God, we proclaim that you died, but that you rose, and that you are coming again in glory. Thank you, Lord. I'd like to lift your voice in prayer this morning. Just give thanks to God today for what He has done for you. There is no life. 
No one like Jesus, no one like Jesus, who died for us to set our spirits free, 
There's no one. No one like Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to see you all this morning. This morning, yes. <laughs> and wonderful to come together and worship. The Lord in spirit and in truth as a body of his people in simple fashion. Amen. Has anybody got anything to share this morning? Anything that uh, you feel the Lord has spoken to you or through, uh, I don't feel throughout the week I blessed you in some way? If you have, just let us know so we can share my blessing with you. about anxiety and just a situation occurred during the week that caused me a bit of anxiety and immediately I prayed about it and I felt peace and then later on throughout the night I started to worry about this issue and I was getting annoyed at myself because I was I knew God was in control of the situation yet <coughs> the battle was still going on between my body and my mind and my faith and it was a real struggle and it actually kept me awake for a while so I was, I was getting annoyed and I was praying and I was like I believe that what I had asked God to do he was going to do but the devil was still coming in to try and irritate me and try and take that peace away and I just felt like your peace nobody can take it away from me but if you allow the devil to steal it from you he can so I just feel like don't let the devil steal your peace. Once you've asked God to do something, he's going to do it, but don't let the devil steal your peace about it. Praise God, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And it is a real battle. We have a real enemy. And he knows how to hone in on something and how to make a mountain of a motive. He knows how to bring in those thoughts that cause you to be anxious. And of course, the right thing to do, as Andrew was saying, is to, to commit it to God and, and and leave it there but it's not always easy just to leave it there because it comes back again and what does the scripture say it says do not be anxious about anything but in all things with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your requests known to god and the peace of god that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind in christ because that's what we need we need the peace of god to be a guard in our hearts and our minds but the enemy comes in and he tries to he knows he can't get you because he's lost you forever, thanks be to God, but he can try and take away that peace. But when we turn to the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and when we turn to him and submit to him and resist those thoughts of anxiety, the Bible says the devil will flee. That means he will run from you. And thank God for the truth of his word. Thank you, Andrew, for, for sharing that. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. But I thank God for what God is doing and has been doing. I was just reminded there this morning, actually, that this is and this month, 17 years since I took over as a leader of this church. We got involved with a group of people here in uh, maybe May or June of 2006. And uh, within a short time, I felt the Lord put it on my heart that he had called me to, to lead the, the work here in Ballina. At the time, there was a, a pastor here from America and a, and a team of um, missionaries that were here for, for a year and um, 
So in, in, by November of, of 2006, I felt this strong call, but I, I wanted to be sure that it was from God. So I said to the Lord, you know, there's, there's, there's a prayer I've been asking an answer to, and I haven't got it yet. So I'm going to put out this fleece. Now this is an Old Testament system that Gideon did to uh, confirm that what the Lord was speaking to him. Uh, and, and to confirm what the Lord was speaking to him, he said, I'm going to put a fleece, which was a, a, a skin of a sheep, outside the door tonight. And when I get up in the morning, if there's dew all around it, and the fleece is dry, then I know you're speaking to me. So he did that when he got up in the morning, and there was dew all around the fleece, and the fleece was dry. But that wasn't good enough for Gideon. He wanted, he wanted more confirmation. So he said, no, Lord, tonight I'm going to take the fleece in. And in the morning, if the fleece is wet, then I know you're speaking to me. So yes, in the morning he got up and the fleece that was inside was wet, so then he knew God was speaking to him. We don't need this in the New Testament because we have the Holy Spirit, but that's something I did for, I don't know what reason, I just did it. I said, Lord, it's November. If by the end of February you've answered this prayer, then I know you're calling me. I'm going to fast in the meantime. I didn't fast. I didn't stop eating. I just didn't eat breakfast. I fasted till about lunchtime except for around Christmas. And a week before the end of February, God answered that prayer. And I knew, I knew in my heart then that God had called me. Now, maybe if I had more faith, I didn't need to do that. I don't know, but that happened. And uh, when I explained that to the pastor, before I told him that God had answered the prayer, I explained that to him. And he said, well, that's this American guy. That's, a, that's an Old Testament method, you know. I said, I know. I, I think he was afraid I was going to say that God said no. But I said, guess what? God answered anyways. So the story is that God has called me to lead this, this church. So that was in February, uh, the end of February, March. Now the pastor who was here from America was to stay another year. And that was great, that was a great encouragement to me. But come September, her mother who was in her 90s got very ill and she had to go back to America and help us in at the deep end where you sink or swim. And I thank God, I thank God that he has helped me to swim and brought me through and I Terry and family by my side and all this wonderful family of God for the past 17 years and God has, has more work, more work to be done. I just felt yesterday that the word he was giving me was the foundation is now complete. Now that's taken a long time but you know what God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. And if you ever look at a, at a house being built this probably more time goes into the foundation and money than you would imagine before anything is good. But the Lord is saying, the foundation is now ready, it's now complete. And the message is that the building is really going to kick off, the building is really going to start. I'm not talking about the physical building, I'm talking about the building of the house of God. When I answered the call, one thing that the Lord asked me to do, well, what he said was, I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now he's building his church all over the world, but for me it was here in Berlinna. I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And all he asked me to do was not to get in his way. And this is the word he gave me. If I want you to be a screwdriver, don't try to be a hammer. In other words, do whatever I've called you to do in the way I've called you to do it. Don't try to be like somebody else. Don't try to imitate somebody else. Just be yourself and allow me to be myself through you. And don't fear because I am. That's great to know this morning. The great I am that spoke to Moses and said, I am is building his church in this day and here as well. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means the devil himself cannot stand against the building of the church of God because he is building it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So just keep keep each other in prayer and keep me in prayer. Amen. And I thank God for everyone here today, amen. You're all precious in his sight and your own part of his plan to reach your generation with the gospel, amen. Our reading this morning is in John's Gospel in chapter 10. And we're going to read the first five verses at first. And Father, as we look at your word, would you pray again? For our hearts to be open, our minds to be open, and our hearts to be open in particular to receive what you want us 
to hear, and that's who you is, that we will make a commitment to you that by your strength and by your power, we would do what we hear. And here Jesus is speaking, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door, he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. The title of my message today is The Abundant Life in Christ. The Abundant Life in Christ. Now here is, here is um, something we're not familiar with in, in, this, in, in the Western countries, but at night in, in those days, sheep were gathered into what was known as a sheepfold to protect them from thieves and robbers and from wild animals. And the sheepfolds, they were usually caves or, or sometimes open areas surrounded by walls of stone or even on branches. And traditionally, the gatekeeper, the one who looked after the sheep at night, would sleep across the doorway to protect the sheep from thieves and robbers. Now the gatekeeper wasn't the shepherd, he was somebody who looked after the sheep, because this wasn't just one flock of sheep. This would be many, many, uh, many flocks of sheep gathered together into the one enclosed area at night time, and then the gatekeeper looked after the sheep. And then when the shepherd would come for his sheep, the gatekeeper of course would recognize him because he had been there before, and the sheep would recognize their shepherd's voice and follow after them. I don't know if you ever saw, if you were ever in, in Israel or in, 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 in countries where, where sheep are mixed up with other sheep. I saw a video once on this, maybe a hundred sheep in a field. And this man comes to the, to the gate and he starts calling. And out of the hundred sheep, maybe 20 or 30, come out of that group and follow him. He walks on and they follow him. They recognize his voice and they followed him. To the rest of the sheep, he was a stranger. So the, sheep, the rest of the sheep didn't listen to his voice or follow him. So the, the shepherd would come in the morning and the gatekeeper would recognize him, so he'd open the door to him, and then he would call on his sheep, and the sheep would follow him. Now the sheepfold that Jesus was speaking about, because he was using this as an example, is the church of God, and the sheep are those he calls to faith, and Christ himself is the door. And anyone who climbs in another way except through the door, that person is a thief and a robber. And his purpose, of course, is to steal the sheep for his own purposes. And here Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees who failed to speak the truth of God's word and instead had stolen God's glory to make a profit of his flock. They weren't in the kingdom of God and they were keeping others out as well. In verse 16, Jesus goes on to say, well, John goes on to say, the figure of speech Jesus used with them, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In Acts chapter 4, I think it is, it says, There is salvation in no other name except the name of Jesus. It's in his name, he is the door, and if anyone enters by him, he will be saved and will go in and out and find a pasture. Now Jesus used this example of the sheepfold and the shepherd to teach that there's only one way into the church of God, and that's through Jesus Christ. But the Jews didn't understand what he was saying. And they didn't understand because they didn't believe that he was who he claimed to be. He claimed he was the Messiah, they didn't believe that. And they were set in their ways and as a result, their minds were not open to anything new. Their minds weren't open to his teaching. Jesus told them plainly that he was the door to the sheep. And if anyone would enter through him, he would be saved and go in and out and find pasture. But they didn't understand it. There is no other way. There is no other way. Later on in John's Gospel, in chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now there's a, 
There's a belief out in the world that, well, there are many paths to God. And if you talk to people who are not Christians, they would say, yeah, my path leads to God as well. There are many paths to God. Now, in a sense, that's true. In a sense, that's true. And in this sense, it's true. Everyone, everyone will one day stand before God. But those who come to the Father, to Jesus, will stand in the place of reward. But those who come any other way will stand in the place of judgment. And they will hear those terrible words. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fires that was prepared for the devil of his angels. I never knew you. I never knew you. So while everybody will find a path to God, many people will find that path turns them away from God. And it's only those who come to faith in, in God through Jesus Christ that will find the path where they are accepted, where they hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest that you have been called to. But the Jews were blind to this truth and they couldn't understand what Jesus was saying because they didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to listen to him. They had their minds, their minds closed. They couldn't listen because they were not of his sheepfold and didn't recognize his voice. Jesus was giving them this life-changing message of the gospel, but it didn't look good because they didn't belong to the flock of God. And then in verse 10 he says, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So now we're in Christ. Now we're in him. Now he has opened, he has been the door that has been opened to us through faith. Now we're in. We can know this life, this life of abundance. The thief, he said, comes to steal, kill and destroy. And the thief's main aim is to steal the sheep for his own gain, for his own profit. And those kind of thieves and robbers, they were the Pharisees and the scribes in the day of Jesus, but they're still in the world today, and they're still stealing, and they're still killing, and they're still destroying by their deception and their lies. And their false teaching eats away at the souls of man like a cancer, poisoning the minds of God's people and leading so many of them astray. And those who become shepherds of God's flock just to enjoy what they want to get out of it, whether it's money or power or fame, they're the worst kind of thieves and robbers. And they will have a lot to answer for on the day of judgment, unless they repent. These, these false prophets and false teachers haven't been called by God and are known by their fruits as they rob the flock of God for worldly gain. And they're absolutely of no benefit to anyone. On the other hand, Jesus said that he came so that his children, those who believe in him, might have life and have it more abundantly. And this abundant life is available to all of God's children. And it is abundant indeed. Now the word abundant, it means plentiful, it means existing or available in large quantities. It means superior in quality, excessive, above all we might ask and think. Now there has been much confusion as to what this abundant life means to the believer. And there are those who teach that this life means that you can always have an abundance of money and big houses and flash cars, wear the best clothes, the finest and most expensive jewelry, and you're successful in every area of your life. That is a gospel, and it's not a gospel. Now, while it's true that there are many believers today who live a life of material abundance, there are also non-believers who have this kind of abundant life as well. But this is not the abundant life that Jesus was speaking of. And a gospel that promises wealth and prosperity as a guarantee is not the real gospel. And if it's not the real gospel, it's no gospel at all. You see, the real gospel, to be the gospel, it has to work in every part of the world. And yet, there are faithful believers in many parts of the world today who have no shoes to put on their feet and they walk miles and miles, several times a week, to hear the word of God being preached. They are enjoying the abundant life that's found not in material possessions, but in Christ Jesus himself. That's the real abundant life that Jesus is talking about. The Greek word for life is the word zoe, Z-O-E, and it means life, referring to that 
principle, our main life in the spirit and soul. This Zoe is all the highest and best that Christ is, which he gives to his loved ones, the highest blessedness of the creature. Paul in the book of Colossians spoke of the mystery of the gospel that had been hidden for generations and he said now was revealed to the saints in Colossians 1.27 he said to them that is to those who believe God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you the hope of glory. This is the richness, this is the glory of the, the mystery of the gospel. Christ in you the hope of glory. The abundant life Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Zoe, this life inside of us, life in the spirit, in the soul, life given by God himself and the highest blessing we can have this side of heaven, which is Christ himself. The highest blessing that you can have this side of heaven is not a 20 bedroom mansion. It's not a flashy Mercedes that costs a couple of hundred thousand. It's not any of this. The abundant life is that life that we have in Christ. And once we realize that this great blessing of abundant life can never be found in anyone or anything outside of God himself, our relationship with God takes off to a whole new level. Because if we're waiting for these things to be added to us, we will never have that relationship with God because we'll always think that God is holding something back. You see, the abundant life is not some material possession. It's not wealth. It's not even health, even though this is part of our walk with God. The abundant life will never be found in another person, will never be found in a life partner, not in a husband, not in a wife. Instead, as the definition of life, or Zoe shows, true abundant life is internal and is found in Christ alone. Now don't misunderstand me. This doesn't mean that we can't have fulfilling relationships. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to have successful careers or nice homes or good cars or decent clothes. It just means that having them is not what he was talking about when he said that he came, that you might have life and have it abundantly. You see, having all the riches in the world will never be able to surpass an intimate love relationship with God. And God likes it that way because... He doesn't want anyone or anything competing for your heart because he is jealous of your complete affection. In Ezekiel, sorry, Exodus 34, 14, he said, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He's jealous for you. He doesn't want your affection to be, to, he doesn't want your, your life to be uh, driven by something or someone else. He wants your life to be found in him and him alone. And today, I believe he's calling people into a di different sense of this abundant life that he has to offer. This life in the spirit grows only to the extent that our relationship with God grows. And the more we listen to him, and the more we do that, the more we will recognize his voice. And the more we recognize his voice, the less we'll be led from his path by other voices that are trying to lead us astray. And we talked about the devil coming in and filling our thoughts with anxious thoughts and, and all, all of that. And she turned to God and she heard God's voice. And God's voice drowned out those other voices. As we spend time reading his word, we're learning to hear his voice. This is how he communicates with us. And we in turn communicate with him when we talk to him in prayer. This is how relationship grows. Now close relationship with another person always requires conversation. And while I know you all here today, there are some of you I know better than others. And the level of relationship I have with someone and you have with someone is directly related to the amount of time we spend together talking to each other. That's how relationships grow. And relationships are built and grow in proportion to the amount of time Two people spend talking together, but in particular, the number of times they both have shared the deep things of their hearts together. And relationships are work, and sometimes they can be hard work, but when you stick at a relationship, it's all worth it. The more time you spend, the more personal the relationship becomes. And a personal relationship with God is the same. There's no different. Conversing with him happens, as I said, through reading the Bible, 
which is the main way that he speaks to us. And prayer makes up the other part of this two-way conversation between you and God. You read your Bible, he talks to you. You pray, you talk to him. And when you pray, he's not asking you for a ritual or a formula. He doesn't want you to pretend to be something that you're not. He doesn't want you to only praise him, to never ask him for anything, or say particular phrases to make yourself sound religious. Instead, he just wants you to tell him what's on your heart and your mind, just as you would a trusted friend. There are many people living lives of anxiety. Complete, and we talked about being anxious. There's a difference between anxious and living a life of anxiety. And there are many people living that life because they have never developed this relationship with God. What did it say in the book of Philippines? Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Before Paul said that, he said these words, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What do you say? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in him. And let your patience be known to everyone. Why do people lose patience? Because they get anxious. And anxiety begins to build up. And next thing they blow a fuse. But Paul said, no, rejoice. Be joyful in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And let your patience, let your reasonableness, your patience be known to all. Don't be anxious. Exactly. Don't be anxious. But in everything, talk to God. Remind Him of His promises. Ask Him for your needs. Give thanks to Him. Make your requests known to Him. And when you do that, He does this. He gives you peace. And that peace guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Just tell Him what you want. What you really, really want. Talk. Yeah, it's simple. It's simple. It doesn't have to be a formula. It doesn't have to be a religious act. I have great conversations with God sometimes sitting on the toilet. That's not, that's not reverent. God is with me ever. He's there anyway. So it's, it's well for me to be talking to him. I say nothing. You can talk to him anywhere. You can read your, not everybody has a phone. You can read your Bible anywhere. Get your phone and your Bible. If you don't have a great reader, listen to it. It's everywhere. He speaks to us. He talks to us through his word. We talk to him through prayer. And the great thing is, as we pray and read his word, we learn how to hear his voice. But it takes time to learn how to accurately hear him. But when you know him, you know him. I use this example. I've used it before. I want to use it again about knowing him. One day at work, uh, one of my colleagues asked me to borrow my car to go downtown. I said, fine, I'll take it with you. And about 10 minutes later, or 15 minutes later, I got a phone call. Ronnie, Ronnie, what's wrong? I don't know what's wrong. I parked my car, and next thing, your wife comes out. She knew me, Terry. Your wife comes out, and she tore strips at me. What was I doing with your car? Why did I have your car? But the first thing that came into my mind was, that's not like Terry. That's not like her. Because I know Terry. So I tried to ring Terry on her phone, of course, there was no answer. I knew Sarah Jane was with her, I rang Sarah Jane, no answer. And a few minutes later, they rang me back, and Terry rang me back with a big laugh, because it was a wind-up. <laughs> they decided this between themselves. Because I was always, you know, I'm always joking and pranking. But I got pranked that day. But the point of this is was, I knew that wasn't like Terry, because I know Terry. And the more you spend time with somebody, the more you know them, and the more you know what they will and they will not do. I had somebody once talk to me where well, this person felt, this person was a believer by all intents and purposes. And this person told me that they felt God tell them to harm somebody. I said, no, he didn't. God would never tell you to harm somebody and if you think God told you to harm somebody, you don't know God. You don't know him. You see, when we know someone, we know what to expect from them, and we know what they expect from us. 
And as we pray and read God's word, we learn to hear his voice. And it takes time to accurately hear his voice. And there's times when I hear his voice and I know clearly it's his voice. And there's times when I'm not sure. But there are many times when you know for sure and other times not so sure. But that's okay because it's more about learning. And the more you understand who God is through his word, the more your mind is renewed. And the more your mind is renewed, the more you'll be able to discern when he is speaking to you and whether when another voice is speaking to you. God is a very personal God. And this journey with Christ, this journey of abundant life in him, it's a very personal one, indeed. And in my relationship with God, sometimes I find it hard to, dis to describe the things that go on between us because there are things that are only felt in the heart. This morning as I woke up, and sometimes these thoughts come to me, I wonder is this the right message for today? And then I read my Bible and there was a scripture confirming it and I just looked up and smiled. And sometimes that's all it takes. Just to smile to let me know, yeah, I get you now. I hear you, I hear you. You see, it's not a big mystery. He knows exactly how to speak to us because he created us. <coughs> he knows exactly what we need to hear. And when we're in a place of true intimacy with God, we can feel that no one else is really able to understand that special bond. Because it's completely personal. And he says things to me in ways that he wouldn't say to you and vice versa. But when you really know him, you know that no one else can do what he does. Like we sang this morning, no one else can touch my heart like you do. No one else can give you words of comfort and encouragement like he does. No one else can speak to your heart like he does. And this is the God who comforts you when you cry. He directs you when you're lost. He rebukes you when you feel like doing something you know you ought not to do. And he guides you when you're unsure of the path ahead. And he loves you when no one else loves you. And in a way that no one else can. You see, you can know the Bible inside out. You can understand the doctrine of salvation. And you can have put your faith in the gospel as the only means of forgiveness and eternal life. But if you've never committed yourself to a close personal relationship with God, you're not living the abundant life that is yours in Christ. You see, you can read your Bible. And you can have your prayer list and do all that. And it can be ritual. Even after you're saved, it can be just a ritual. We need conversation. And we need to really listen with our hearts when we're reading the Bible. You can have your prayer list and use it. But spend time just talking to God. Imagine if I came to Terry tomorrow morning and I said, Terry, sit down for a minute, I want to talk to you. I have a list of things here I want you to do for me. Imagine how that would go. <laughs> Not so well. Not so well. But because we have this relationship, if I say to Terry, Terry, there's something I'd like you to do for me, that's not a problem. Because the conversation goes on. We talk, we talk, we talk. We've been talking for 45 years. Not all the time. But we've been talking. And that's how you get to know somebody, talking to them, talking with them. Not talking down to them, but talking with them. And like any relationship, it takes time. It's not difficult. God doesn't ask you to change yourself before you commit yourself to a personal relationship with him. He just asks you to come as you are and learn from him. And as we come to an end of this message today, just this one thing. Many, many years ago, at a conference, I went forward for prayer. And I asked this dear old man of God, I said, Lord, I want to know God better. And I was expecting him to pray a prayer over me that would open my mind and have just like instant revelation. Do you know what he said? He said, Ronnie, there's no shortcut to spending time with God. There's no shortcut to spending time with God. Now if the time that I speak with God is five minutes in the morning reading my Bible and a quick prayer as I go out the door or a quick prayer at night time before I go to sleep. Then 
I'm not spending the time required to grow in my relationship with God. And if you're doing that, you're not spending the time required to grow in your relationship with God. You see, as you go to trust him and believe what he says in his word more and more, your love affair with him will become increasingly fulfilling. And this abundant life that he talks about, this abundance of Zoe will grow inside your spirit and soul when you give him your time. When you give him your time. Our relationship with God is meant to be a lifelong conversation. And this is all part of the abundant life that Christ has promised. I'm just reminded, I walked in Connemara for nearly five years. It's two and a half hours drive from my home to where I began to work. And then I spent the whole day around uh, the villages. But each day on the way down, there was, a, there was an old sandpit that I would pull into and have my morning tea. And then I would read my Bible, and then I would talk to God. And that was my sacred place. I didn't pass that place any morning without pulling in. Because that's where God and myself spent time together. I would listen to tapes, I would listen to the Bible online. On, on, not online, but on, on, my, on my, when I say tapes, I'm telling my, my age now. I would listen to tapes of the Bible and tapes of teaching. This was my, this was my Bible, I haven't been to Bible college, but that was my Bible college. Time spent with God. And those times I really, really enjoyed. And even if I was very late and some morning something would happen and I'd be late, and you know, customers don't like it when you're late, but I would always pull in and just have that time with God. It was a discipline. Then life got busy and that, that, that stopped. And then God put it on my heart one morning to get up in the middle of the night. And I spent a number of years getting out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, coming downstairs and talking to God and listening to God and falling asleep in the middle of it sometimes. The point I'm making is we have to make a sacrifice if we want to have this abundant life. And the sacrifice is the only thing that God has given us that we have control over and that's our time. It's not the only thing, but it's one thing, our time. And as we spend time, just giving him quality time, we benefit. We change on the inside because he is changing us. And this becomes a walk of life for us. Our lifelong conversation with God is, is the abundant life. The thief comes to steal and he steal your time if you can. You know, how often have you spent maybe a half an hour or an hour watching something silly on the television that you know this, or scrolling through Facebook and yet you find it difficult to find 10 minutes in the morning to read your Bible and talk to God. That happens. That does happen. But we have to make that time. We have to make that sacrifice. And if we're in the habit of doing it, we'll miss an hour morning, but that's okay. That's okay. The thief comes to steal and he steals our time. He kills our joy and he, he, he tries to destroy our relationship but jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly that zoe life that 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 life of abundance so your path to this abundant life is laid out before you and all the more you talk and listen to him the more that relationship grows and the more it grows the more you will walk in this abundant life. That Zoe life that exists in such huge quantities and quality, life in the spirit and soul, the highest and best that Christ is, which he gives to his loved ones, the highest blessing available to man, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a conversation. It's a two-way conversation. And that's where abundant life is. And when you seek him, and his kingdom, which is the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. All you need will be added to you as well. You won't even have to ask him. All you need will be added to you as well. And I have to say that God has provided for me and my family in such a way since we came to know him. It's just amazing. And in the past 17 years, since stepping out of full-time employment, God has provided every need every need. I don't even have to ask him because he knows what we need. And if he knows what I need and provides it, he'll do for you, for you as well. And all you have to do is believe. That's all he asks of you.
Father, we just thank you for the life that we have in your son, Jesus. We just thank you. We just thank you for that abundant life, that life beyond measure, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Help each and every one of us, Lord God, to, to develop more and more each day our relationship with you, Lord God. To be in that conversation where we listen and we speak. Where we spend time listening to you through your word and getting to know you and talking to you through prayer so you get to know us. We just bless your name. We just thank you. But above all else, Lord God, we thank you that on that day when we see you face to face, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because it's not us that has been good and faithful, but Jesus. And when we're welcomed, we're welcomed. Because Jesus has been welcomed. All about him. So we want to know you more and more, God, every day. We want to know this abundant life more and more. Because you said you have come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And as we seek it, Lord, as we seek you, Lord God, in prayer and in your word, we know that everything we need will be added to us as well. Because you know what we need before we even ask. So we thank you now in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.